So what is Buddhist art? I'll have an introduction to that huge topic coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith, I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in helping to try to promote a, a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing to the channel. So this is a bit of a departure for us talking about Buddhist artwork. I had a recent uh, discussion on Buddhist iconography, but this is going to get a little bit more in, in depth and expanse about Buddhist artwork in general. And, well, I mean, you know, but it's not that, that far away in the sense that many of us look to, to art in general, uh, icons, paintings, sculpture, going to museums, as ways of relaxing, of, of uh, diverting our minds, or maybe putting our minds onto something that we feel is, is higher or greater than ourselves. So let's start with a little bit of history uh, of Buddhist art. And, and let me just say, to begin with, obviously much too big of a topic for me to, to cover in anything like a complete sense in, in a short video. Uh, so I'll be just sort of picking and choosing some highlights with emphasis on the early tradition and how that uh, influenced the later uh, sort of icon iconographic tradition that we find. So uh, the traditional picture that we have um, about uh, Buddhist art is that it began as an iconic, that is, that it began without a portrayal of the Buddha's figure in particular. That instead of portraying the body of the Buddha or the person of the Buddha, uh, it was portrayed that he was, that the, that he was not around, what you had were uh, empty thrones or trees or just the Buddha's footprint. And I have an example here that I can show from Gandhara from the first century, uh, first century of the Common Era. And we see here just the footprint with uh, this kind of wheel on it and uh, a little icon of three gems at the bottom. I believe those are the three gems that are supposed to represent the triple gem of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. The wheel would be the wheel of Dharma, and we'll get, get to that in a minute. So the idea was that, that uh, er, the early Buddhist tradition was ic an iconographic, did not represent the Buddha's person, because the Buddha had uh, attained enlightenment, attained uh, parinirvana, which was what happened after his death. He was uh, nowhere to be found, nowhere to be traced, as they say in the old texts. So as a result, making images of him was sort of counterproductive in a way. It was sort of implying that he was still around when he was not. That said, in the later 20th century, uh, Susan Huntington and her husband John Huntington at Ohio State University made something of a controversy about this. Their, their, their claim was that, in fact, it wasn't at all clear that there was an aniconographic tradition within early Buddhism. In other words, there are, in fact, images of the Buddha that we can find really quite, quite a long way back. Uh, well into the period when it was supposedly true that they only had footprints and empty thrones and so on. They also claim that these uh, dep depictions of thrones and trees were depictions of places rather than supposedly d depictions of the Buddha. So their claim is that, the, that, that there were icons of the Buddha, in fact, and, and probably a lot of them were uh, made in uh, perishable materials like wood, so we just don't have them. And if there had been an aniconographic tradition, it probably was shorter than people believe. Maybe only 100 years, 150 years, in any event, a short period of time that didn't go up until, let's say, the Common Era. One interesting point that they make is that there's, in the entire corpus of Buddhist writings at the time, there's only a single reference to sort of an iconographic tradition, that is to say, a prohibition on making images of the Buddha. That's in one text of the Sarvastivada Vinaya. The Sarvastivada school was one of the schools at the time. Their Vinaya would have been their uh, book of law for uh, rules for their monastics. And in that Vinaya, there's a sort of a story where Anattapindika goes to the Buddha and says, well, I know we're not supposed to make images of you, but can I at least make images of the bodhisattvas that surround you? And the Buddha says, yes. And the fact that there's reference to bodhisattvas surrounding the Buddha means this is almost certainly uh, a late text, probably stems from the early Mahayana tradition, which is where we find the, the notion of bodhisattvas coming into being. Uh, and the, the Huntingtons say that this is probably a text that shows that people were making images at the time, and that the Sarvastivada school in particular was opposed to them. Nevertheless, apart from this one uh, passage, there seems to be no seems to have been no controversy about making Buddhist images. Now, we don't find it in any of the texts. It's not recorded anywhere. 
And so as a result, the Huntingtons say that we're making, basically it seems to me that they're saying that we're making a mountain out of a molehill. There just aren't very many of them, but, you know, so it may have been just sort of a thing that people didn't tend to do, or they didn't do it in stone, they did it in perishable materials. Um, in any event, we don't find any reason to believe that the, Buddhist, the Buddhists in general were opposed to images. Also, as they note, uh, the making and owning and even viewing of images was uh, an item of merit within Indian culture generally and within Buddhism throughout history. So we, their claim, which I think is reasonable, is that you would have expected a people at the time, particularly after the Buddha's uh, death, to have wanted something at least to be able to view and remember the Buddha by. The practice of remembering the Buddha and remembering the Buddha's deeds was indeed a practice of early Buddhism. So there's no reason to believe that, that making an image, at least in remembrance, would have been a problem. Nevertheless, the, you know, the earliest images in quantity that we find of the Buddha happen in uh, the common era, let's say early first century. And uh, some of the earliest were in Gandhara, which is in Pakistan. And they were very influenced by uh, Greece, the Greek tradition, because that came out of the Hellen Hellenistic tradition with, um, with Alexander the Great's conquest of that part of the world. There was a good, great deal of blending, and some of that would have included a blending of, of artistic and sculptural kinds of traditions. This is not to say that all of Buddhist iconography came out of the Greek tradition. I think that's a kind of a Western centered approach. There were certainly other iconographic traditions within India, but uh, the Gandhara tradition was certainly one of the strongest and most important. And here we have a, a very, very interesting example of a Gandhara in bronze uh, from the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, this is really one of my favorite early images. It's from uh, the first century to the mid-second century somewhere, you know, very, very early. And you can see that it's, he has a full head of hair. I discussed uh, the Buddha's hair in a previous uh, video. Uh, top knot. It looks very uh, human. It, it's not. It hasn't uh, gelled into what's called the Ushnisha in the later tradition, which we'll discuss. He has a mustache. Uh, you can see he has a crown that looks sort of like a, a sun. And the the, the Metropolitan Museum, when they, when they discuss this this particular uh, work of art, they say it's probably one of the earliest icon iconic representations of Shakyamuni the Buddha from Gandhara. He sits in a yogic posture, holding his right hand in Abhaya Mudra, which is a gesture of approachability or friendliness. His unusual halo has serrations that indicate radiating light. His hairstyle, the form of his robes, and the treatment of the figure reflect stylistic contacts with the classical traditions of the West. In other words, this looks something like a Greek sculpture. More typically, uh, in Gandhara, we find sculptures like this uh, out of stone. Uh, this is in the Tokyo Museum, I believe. This Here we see the top knot, the hair, in more of what will become the Ushnisha, this kind of fleshy protuberance on the top of his head. Over time, it developed from a top knot of hair into some sort of part of his skull or part of his head uh, as some kind of uh, auspicious, uh, auspicious mark of who he was. Again, we can see the folds here. It looks like an, a Greek sculpture, a Greek uh, stone sculpture. The facial features, again, look somewhat Greek. And this is from the first or second century uh, of the Common Era as well. So a similar kind of time period, maybe a tad later than the bronze. Uh, and as I discussed in a, in a previous video, uh, this, this notion of the Buddha having hair uh, when he was almost certainly bald, this comes from uh, later hagiographic descriptions of the, the marks of a great man, and those included the, the notion that on the soles of his feet he had thousand spoked wheels. Uh, the Buddha was, of course, uh, des described in the early texts as uh, turning the wheel of the Dharma, so he was sort of a wheel turner. And as a result, the, the, the notion that, that his body actually had wheels on them and on the soles of the feet was uh, supposedly a, a mark of his, uh, of his greatness. And we see that, we saw that on the anaconographic uh, footprint of the Buddha, the, 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 the wheels and the soles of his feet. In the later tradition, we'll also find wheels on his palms of his hands, even those, though that never is discussed in the early texts. Probably most of us will be uh, most familiar with a Buddha in what's called the Bhumisparsha Mudra, or the earth-touching gesture, uh, like this one. This is a, a very a beautiful Buddha, again, in the, in the Met Metropolitan Museum collection um, from the Sukhothai tradition in Thailand, 15th century. And here we see the Buddha touching the ground with uh, his right hand. That is supposed to be at the moment of his enlightenment, when Mara is asking him, well, if there are no selves, if there's a non-self tradition, basically if you teach non-self, 
who is going to witness your enlightenment, and he touches the ground, and in that gesture uh, he becomes awakened. And that is also uh, a text, I should say, not from the early tradition, that is a later text. So we might call from the more sort of mythological period of, of Buddhist writing. Now this Buddha from, from Thailand is an example of a Theravada uh, image, and in general within uh, uh, the Theravada, which is a school of Buddhism in Southeast Asia, uh, they, t they take as their uh, founding uh, documents of Buddhism, the, 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 the Pali Nikayas, which are probably the earliest texts we have, and they're mostly focused on the, the person of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, and as a result we tend within the Theravada tradition uh, to have more examples of images of the Buddha himself, of, of Shakyamuni Buddha, or at least that they're much larger than the other images around them. Within the Mahayana tradition, however, there's a much larger pantheon of deities. The Mahayana tradition came from the northern tradition of, of India, and then eventually spread into uh, the rest of northern Asia, uh, China, Japan, Korea, and somewhat down into parts of the southern Asia as well. And within a Mahayana context, we will tend to have much more, many more examples of, let's say, bodhisattvas, of, of different kinds of deities, celestial beings, uh, that, are, that are all uh, venerated and worshipped in the same way that the Buddha would be, that the that Shakyamuni Buddha would be, or, or that an image of him would be. Then a separate offshoot, I would say, of the Mahayana is what's called the Vajrayana, or Thunderbolt School, of esoteric Buddhism, which is much more interested in sort of magic, uh, really uh, explicitly religious aspects. And there you get w what I might call some really fearsome and overtly sexualized images as well, uh, such as this one of uh, Manju Vajra and Vidyadhara uh, from 17th, 18th century in Tibet. You probably will have seen many of these kinds of figures if you've gone to any kind of uh, um, a museum show that shows Tibetan iconography. Tibetan iconography in general is, I would say, a lot more over the top, a lot more Baroque, expansive, detailed, uh, kind of wild than what we would find in the earlier traditions. Although within India, of course, there is also a tradition of, of this kind of wild imagery as well, so it kind of came out of that, uh, that part of the world for sure. Another thing that comes out of uh, Tibet and Nepal and that area of the world in the, in the highlands are these uh, mandalas and paintings or tankas, and these have a, a, what we might call a, a didactic purpose. Whereas an image of the Buddha is just an image of the Buddha in many ways, although it may teach some things, these mandalas uh, in particular were, were meant to teach uh, quite a bit of the Dharma in the sense that if you were to understand all the different aspects and icons in them, they were supposed to teach you the path towards awakening within the Vajrayana school. And as a result, what they ended up being is, is, is both teaching aids, but in particular meditative aids, that you as a viewer were meant to enter them in a meditative state and find your way around them. And you were supposed to practice this to the extent that you were that you were able to carry out the meditation without the aid, without the use of this aid. This was an aid that could be put away eventually once you'd learned it in in, in the detail necessary. So they're very standardized, very stylized, because again, they are basically templates for learning and meditation. So now to to change a little bit from from Tibet, the highlands into China and Japan, and then Korea. Uh, probably one of the most famous uh, aesthetic movements is the Zen aesthetic movement, the, the aesthetic movement that came out of the Zen tradition, the Chan tradition, which is a very deep and old tradition uh, coming out of a blending of different schools uh, of both Buddhism uh, as well as uh, Taoism from China. And here we have a good example of a painting in the Zen tradition. Again, it's very simplified. The, the, the aesthetic in Zen is, is an aesthetic of simplicity, an aesthetic of, of nature, of natural things, rather than the kind of Baroque, over-the-top kind of imagery we have in Tibet. The idea is to leave behind the kind of learning, the kind of book learning and other kinds of learning that was necessary for the Vajrayana tradition. Instead, uh, to leave the learning behind and simply to focus on uh, seeing the world the way it was, just just sitting, just doing. And so you have this kind of simplicity. Here we have uh, a Zen master with a, a stick on his, his lap that we, he would use to wake up uh, monks who were, who were napping during their meditation, but he's here in the mountains, uh, in, in nature. That's all. It's just very, very simple. And this tradition, of course, became very, very important within uh, Japanese aesthetics generally. 
there are two concepts that are, I think, critical to understanding Japanese aesthetics. One is the notion of wabi-sabi, or the, the beauty of transience, the beauty of imperfection. That is, we might say, uh, the beauty involved in the three marks of, ex uh, of existence. Now, the three marks of existence in Buddhism go back all the way to the early tradition. They are uh, that all things are changing, that all things are imperfect or unsatisfactory in some sense, and that all things are non-self. And so this notion of wabi-sabi is, is, is sort of an aesthetic way of getting, getting that together in, in a kind of a, a single uh, work of art, or many works of art. So for example, let's take this uh, absolutely beautiful uh, Shino tea bowl from the late 16th century. And you see, it, it's certainly not at all symmetric. It, it seems imperfect rough, almost like it was made at the last minute. These are all marks of, of imperfection, of transience, of roughness. It's simple, modest, but at the same time it's obviously been made by a great master. Um, a lot of this simplicity and modesty uh, we can take with a grain of salt. Clearly it takes a lifetime of skill to be able to, to manufacture something that is both so beautiful and so simple and rough in this sense. It's an aesthetic. Similarly, there's the concept in Japanese aesthetics of mono no aware, or the, the pathos of things, the, the sort of sadness, the transience involved in life. Again, part of these uh, three marks of existence, that all things are passing, and that all things are, to that extent, imperfect. And one of the most famous examples of this is uh, the devotion to uh, cherry blossom season within Japan. Cherry blossoms, of course, are one of the uh, premier uh, aesthetic examples of this mono no aware. The, the cherry blossoms are gorgeous, they're beautiful, but they're only around for a few days, maybe a week, but, and of course their, their beauty is part they're falling from the tree, and when they fall from the tree they, they lie on the ground and eventually rot. And the beauty isn't simply the beauty of being aware of how pretty the cherry blossoms are, but it's this kind of wistfulness, that the cherry blossoms are not just beautiful, but they have a wistful they have a wistful aspect to them in that they're not going to be around for very long. And that we're aware of that because they're not being around for long is something that's occurring right in front of us. We, we are aware of the change as it's happening. So for example, we have this beautiful woodblock print by Hiroshige, Cherry Blossoms in the Evening from 1831. Beautiful both because it displays the cherry blossoms, and this uh, looks like a young boy looking at the cherry blossoms, but also it's in the evening, so it's the sun is going down, things are going to night, things are changing. It's a, it's a, it's a picture that's clearly redolent of, of a lot of that kind of wistful emotional sense. Finally, there are contemporary Buddhist uh, artists, like uh, in particular I was thinking of the, the composer Philip Glass, who is uh, very much a, a Tibetan Buddhist and on the board of Tricycle Magazine, uh, as well as write, having written uh, any number of, of pieces of, of, of music, both uh, for for small groups and for op huge operas. He says that a lot of his early inspiration was from Indian musicians like Ravi Shankar, I, with whom I believe he studied for a while. And so his, his tradition, he believes, does come out of India, but I mean his Buddhism is shown, I think, in the kinds of, of, of topics he takes on and in his sort of outlook to life. So while that is, uh, I would say, a, a very, very short nutshell of the history of, of Buddhist art, I do want to say one more thing, which is that Buddhism in its, in its infancy and in its beginning and its, its roots has a real problem with, uh, with sensual delight, with sensual desire. And yet all of art is to an extent sensual. It's something that we appreciate through our eyes and through our ears if it's music or through our, our fingers if it's a tea bowl, uh, through taste if we're, if we're uh, savoring a good food. And to that extent, there's a real question as to whether there's any real thing such as Buddhist art. That is to say, anything that can really be understood from within the Buddhist tradition as, as artwork which is uh, both Buddhist and beneficial in that sense. Now, I think I've given some roots towards seeing some of, the, some of these Buddhist artworks as certainly didactic, that is, teaching parts of the Dharma, and others of it as uh, displaying the Dharma in, in showing, let's say, the three marks of existence in certain ways. But still, I think we have to keep that in the back of our minds as to what extent uh, any artwork is really Buddhist in, in having the, the deep dharma of understanding that, that all, of, all sensual delight is itself problematic. And I will have a talk on, on that very issue uh, in the future, in the near future. So stay tuned. But I would be interested in, in your own take on, on Buddhist artwork because it is such a huge topic and I'm sure mo many of you 
uh, will have experience with a great range of Buddhist artwork that I haven't touched on today or maybe that I even don't even know about. So I'd be really interested, I'm sure other people would, uh, you know, in the, down in the comments to, to let us know what you think. Uh, let us know what you think about what I've said, but uh, more importantly probably, uh, let us know uh, how you approach Buddhist artwork. Maybe you're even a Buddhist artist. Uh, there are many, many of them. I've mentioned only one, but one out of many. So um, anyways, thanks so much for your kind comments and questions in the past. Uh, thanks for any new ones you give, and we will try to catch you on the next video, okay? Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.